Good morning, Moosehorn friends. I'm uh, glad to be with you today to bring a message from God's Word. Let me begin by extending an apology to you for my poor planning uh, in looking ahead to how February is going to play out and scheduling my time to be up there with you in person. I completely overlooked the fact that uh, my son's 25th birthday was, uh, was going to take place today the day of this recording. And um, I didn't want to leave Robert and Marianne to celebrate the birthday uh, alone. And so with Conrad, uh, with Conrad's uh, kind permission, I decided I was going to record this message for you uh, this weekend. So again, my apologies for any of you who were expecting me to be there in person. Um, but um, that's the decision I've made, obviously. Today, I want to continue our series of messages on the subject of the pastor, his call and his care. And we're kind of transitioning into a kind of mini series within the series, and that is pastor and the ministry of the word. So today, uh, I thought that before we get into the practical outworking of, of how this is done, how the pastor thinks in going about the ministry of the word, that it would be very useful for us to look particularly at the doctrine uh, of the word of God, because it is this that really forms the uh, heart of the um, significance of the ministry of the word for the pastor. And as we likely know, the ministry of the word is really the, the, the main and fundamental ministry that a pastor offers. When Jesus says, feed my sheep to Peter, it is generally in reference to the feeding in God's truth, feeding in the gospel, feeding in the word of God. So that's where we want to go today. And in doing that, I want to... Uh, dip into a significant passage from the Old Testament and uh, one from the Gospel as we unpack the doctrine of the Word. So be, as we begin, would you turn uh, with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. And I want to read an entire stretch here of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 14 down to chapter 4 and uh, verse 4. And then at the heart of it stands a very familiar verse many of you have memorized, I'm sure, uh, along the way in your Christian life, which speaks to us of the importance and the significance of uh, the Word of God. Now as we do that, uh, I'd like to uh, have you um, um, think about this in your mind a little bit. It's a question I heard about a week ago uh, in one of the Q&A sessions of one of my podcasts that I listened to. And the question was something like this. Is it the scriptures that change the person or is it the Holy Spirit? Which is it? Is it the scriptures that change a person or is it the Holy Spirit? And it's uh, quite an interesting question and uh, one that requires a little bit of thoughtfulness, I think, in, uh, before we jump into answering it. So I have that uh, spinning around in your head a little bit as we do this. So let's pray first and, uh, and then hear from the word of God. Loving God, our Father, how we praise you for the fact that you have not left us as orphans, but you have come to us and made us your very children. And uh, at what a great and wonderful cost of outpoured love for us in that your son um, gave his life fully for we who did not deserve it, we're not even seeking this love, but you poured out your love and your salvation towards us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that in having received us by faith, that you have also given to us the gift of your word that uh, invites us into a relationship with you and to knowledge, practical knowledge and understanding of who you are and what it is to uh, live the Christian life as citizens of your kingdom. So please instruct our hearts and our minds today. Change our lives as we look to your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, chapter 3 rather, uh, verse 14. You recall that Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a young man appointed to do a kind of a pastoral role in the city of Ephesus. And this is his ongoing instruction with that, with that ministry. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing that from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God, and some of the translations inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So particularly, we want to have in our minds uh, this morning, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. The man of God may be, it's interesting, the choice of the word, competent. And what man doesn't want to be competent? We, I think this is the worst thing for a man, to be incompetent. But the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So let's think about this principle here as we uh, in the coming time, consider the, the ministry of the word and uh, the pastor's part in that. The uh, verse 16 starts off uh, in the old translations, the script, all scriptures are inspired by God, inspired by God. And this is an interesting word. Uh, and the English translation, the old English translation, actually is perhaps a little... Um, deceptive in, in some ways because of the way that the word inspired is used now uh, nowadays. We tend to think of inspiration as something that happens within us, that we see a sunset, we hear a poem, we listen to a song, we see an individual, we experience something that inspires our creative imaginations, that inspires our insights or, or the like. And uh, so incorrectly people have sometimes translated this passage as saying that the scriptures are given to us to uh, act as a kind of a catalyst for our own personal awareness our own personal inspiration and uh, the arising of some creative insight or help in the course of the living of our lives and, and so it puts all of god's work really at in, into uh, into us, our hearts and our minds, and uh, the source of truth or understanding or insight or inspiration, uh, really, in, in our own hearts, and that is not what this scripture passage is actually saying. The word that uh, Paul is using is theo nuotos and um, theo God, and uh, the Newton. Uh, uh, nustos is the word that um, we think of in, in English words as, as pneumatics, for example. It talks about the power of, um, of air to generate energy. And uh, it's the word that is also uh, at the heart of the words for spirit, which is translated in the scriptures as spirit, can also be translated as breath or, or wind. And so this is where we get the idea of in spirit, uh, inspiration. It, it, it's, it's inspired as inspired by the spirit. It's kind of the idea. But it, it also carries with it the idea that it is uh, God's outbreathed uh, word, that it's outbreathed by God. 
So unfortunately in English we have inspired, but it's really almost expired. It's or, or not expired in the sense of giving up the ghost, but it's uh, exhaled. The word of God is exhaled from God and it's God breathed. And we see that this God breathed word, scriptures, is useful. It's practical. It's it's not just a, a spiritual curiosity for those who are odd enough to care about things like theology or Bible history or uh, trivia games, but rather it is a word that is given to us from God as he uh, expresses it out and then he gives it to us in a way that it serves uh, a practical, useful purpose and i like the old translation that says profitable because who doesn't care about something being profitable and uh, we are told that the scriptures are profitable for us and uh, therefore uh, vital in the living of our christian lives and in our life together as the church so as we think about this and uh, think about the inspiration the going forth from god of his word let's let's take a little journey back into the old testament and to the book of isaiah so if you'll find that with me isaiah chapter 55 i want to read verses 6 to 11 and we have no way in time enough to dip into all that's here but i just want us to get a taste of what uh, the prophet and god is saying through us through the prophet about his word uh, Isaiah chapter 55, starting at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, from, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the things for which I send it. And so you see from this passage, this invitation from God to seek him, a, con a, a, a truth from God that says that his way of considering and thinking and his understanding is far above us. But in calling us to seek him, he says, his word has gone forth. It gives life to our life, essentially. And it will accomplish that purpose for which he expressed it. And your mind might, might go back to the very beginning where in all of God's work of creation, it says God said. God spoke the universe into existence. And it is the power of his expressed will, his expressed word, that gives life, gives reality, gives meaning to uh, that which we see around us. And that sets us up now to understand something of the importance of the word of God. The scriptures are the expressed impartation of God's will. And in going forth from God, it accomplishes his purpose. And, and this is why the preaching of the word, the teaching of the word, is so incredibly fundamentally important to us as, as pastors, but within our church, within our churches, within our families, within our Christian lives. Because it is by this means that God not only reveals his truth and his understanding to us, but also accomplishes those very things. I like the way Paul, Paul puts it with regard to the gospel, for the, uh, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe, to the Jews first and 
also to the Gentiles. And so it is in the impartation, the delivering of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that this actually generates the change, generates the life and the salvation that God intends uh, to accomplish. And you'll remember again from Isaiah that my word that goes out from my mouth shall not return empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose shall succeed at the things for which I sent it. We remember what Paul said. This all scriptures are God breathed and are useful. Indeed, useful. Because these words, these scriptures, these word for this word from God is that which generates life and um, and it gives us light. So let's uh, go now to the Gospels, uh, Matthew chapter 5. This is a very important portion of scripture uh, with regard to the doctrine of the word of God. Matthew chapter 5, it's in the early parts of the uh, familiar Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what our Savior says. Do not think that I have come to a, this is verse 17, Matthew 5. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now this phrase, law and prophets, this is a phrase that encompasses all of the uh, Old Testament scriptures. The law being the book of Moses, the prophets being the source of God's word of, of the writings that, that are there preserved. And this was indeed the scriptures of the early church and um, the scriptures of Jesus. And so he's referring to the, the Old Testament Bible, Old, told to us Old Testament scriptures. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so you see how Jesus is putting emphasis upon the Old Testament scriptures. It's not something that he's there to undo. And I, and I think falsely in some Christian circles, uh, there's this idea presented that now that Jesus has come and the gospel has come, we can ignore the Old Testament. And here he, he asserts that the Old Testament is not being undone in any way. In fact, he is there to fulfill all of the Old Testament and any teachers that come afterwards to diminish or add to this scripture uh, are, are actually dishonoring and, and um, God's law and will come under his condemnation. So let me just uh, reflect on this a little bit as, as we consider all scripture is inspired by God and useful. Paul, uh, Jesus here in Matthew chapter 5, is saying to us that it is the whole word of God. And that for us in our day includes the Old Testament scriptures. From Genesis to Malachi, it, the little books that are obscure, the lar larger books that seem so complicated because of the um, commandments with regard to the Old Covenant, uh, Old Covenant ritual laws, etc. The whole word is uh, is affirmed by Christ. So we have that idea, but it's also the, the written word. This uh, translation, the English Standard Version, uh, uses not an iota, not a dot. An iota is a, uh, a small uh, Greek letter, and uh, the dot is what is used to, to punctuate. And, and these are terms that are referred to, these are uh, references to written language, aren't they? In the old uh, King James, it says, not one jot, not one tittle. And it sounds so odd to our English uh, minds, even um, rather amusing. But a, a jot is yod, the, a little Hebrew stroke. And one little tittle is just a, a stroke of a pen in the, in the Hebrew written language. It's not a letter in itself. It's a little stroke of a pen that would 
transform one letter into another letter. So it's like we have the capital letter I, but if we put a little across it, that would be the iota that changes an I into a, a T. And he's saying it's not even the smallest letter, not the little tiniest stroke of a pen is going to pass away until it's all done. And so this is clearly a reference to the written word. It, it puts in mind uh, the book of Revelation, where in the early chapters of the Revelation, God is identified as the Alpha and the Omega. And at the end of Revelation, it's Jesus who is identified as the Alpha and Omega. And it's a good reminder to us all that Jesus is God. But what are Alpha and Omega? Well, they are written letters that only makes sense with a written alphabet. Alpha being the first Greek letter, omega being the, the last Greek uh, letter in the alphabet. And isn't it interesting that uh, Jesus and God are identified as alpha and omega, the A and the Z, which makes no sense except for there being something written. It's a good reminder to us of how important the written word of God is. There are those in more liberal churches and so on that consider the word of God as, as something other than the Bible. They consider the word of God as that message that we that inspires us as we, we study this book. But they don't believe that the very written word of God is, is, is truthful and unchanging or reliable even. They just see it as a, a means of inspiring us as we have a, some sort of contact with the Holy Spirit to, to instruct our minds and to direct our lives. But uh, clearly in the scriptures, this written word, the very written words, even, uh, even the stroking of a pen and the tiniest letters, uh, these themselves are of utmost importance to God's word going forth and the word that we are to receive by being instructed or uh, being uh, taught in, uh, by a pastor or, or someone else. So this is something that's really, really important. And what Jesus is saying is that, and, and remember, Jesus is identified in John. He is the living word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And this word we understand to be Jesus Christ now come in the flesh, tabernacling among us. It is this living word, this uh, expression of the very Godhead living among us, who is Jesus, who now speaks the word that we have written in the scriptures. And in so doing, he says, the whole scriptures, the very words and the strokes of a pen themselves are sent forth by him. And it's a reminder to us that, uh, and we remember uh, that the prophet Isaiah has already said this, that the word of God is powerful. It accomplishes that which for which it is purpose. And Jesus says it will be fulfilled. In fact, Jesus says, the whole word, this written word, will be, fu be fulfilled by him. Remember, uh, perhaps uh, after Jesus' resurrection, that wonderful scene where two disciples are walking back home, we presume, to Emmaus, and uh, they're puzzling in their minds over all of the things that have unfolded in, in the uh, recent days and the, the death of Jesus and her terrible uh, death on the cross. Uh, the hurt and disappointment and fear of the disciples, and now the reports of his being alive again. And they're talking about all of this. And Jesus himself comes along, and they, they're not able to recognize him. I think there was, a, there was an intentional veiling of their ability re to recognize him so that they could hear and, and understand the, uh, the lesson that they were going to receive from Jesus. So they're talking about things, and Jesus comes along not recognized, asks them what they're talking about. He says, they say, well, you're walking the same direction. Aren't you aware of what's been going on in Jerusalem these days regarding Jesus? And then this stranger supposedly starts to speak with them about the significance of all that is happening. And here, listen to uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 25. Here's, here's what Jesus is saying and not yet revealed to them for who he is. He said to them, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Again, referencing the scriptures. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, the law, and all the prophets, again, the law and the prophets, he inter interpreted to them in all the scriptures 
things concerning himself. And uh, consider this, think about this today if you would, but what Jesus is asserting is that the whole Bible, Genesis to Malachi and now to uh, Revelation, are all speaking of him. And if we are to be a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must therefore be in preaching and imparting the word of God. And we as Christians, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, need to be hearing and receiving and feeding on this word uh, because it is all about Jesus. And it is this word that Jesus is fulfilling. This is why the Bible talks about our speak, um, taking in the word the way we would um, chew and swallow uh, a, a dainty morsel. It's likened to food, but it's also likened to honey. We, we take this word in, and as this living word takes root in our lives, it, God is doing his work, and Jesus is doing his work, fulfilling all of his purposes in us through this word. And uh, so it's a good reminder that it is uh, inspired in this way, that God has spoken his truth and God has sent forth his word. The living word has now come and the living word is fulfilling all of the spoken word. And this word comes with power and purpose and intention by God and is by this means that he will accomplish all that he intends to do. That is why for us, the scriptures, the preaching of the word, the study of the word, the memorizing of the word, the learning of the word, the teaching of the word, all of these things are critical as this is God's primary means for doing his work in our lives. So we come back to our question. Are we changed by the word or are we scriptures? Or are we changed by the Holy Spirit? And the answer is yes. It is of course the Holy Spirit doing his work, but this is a Holy Spirit book and the Holy Spirit's channel and vehicle and the Holy Spirit's words inspired that are now used to transform our lives. They also form for us an unchanging bedrock to our convictions regarding truth and regarding Jesus, regarding right and regarding wrong. All of these things unchanging because this written word doesn't change. Letters don't change on our page. And it is this means that he keeps us in the truth and keeps us on his way as we follow him. I hope, I hope you really value a pastor who values the word. I hope when you come to worship on Sunday that you're coming expectant to hear God's word as the scriptures are opened and taught and proclaimed. And so finally we come and I'll run through this quickly now. All scriptures are God breathed and they are useful. And uh, the usefulness of this word now becomes dramatically evident. He's already said it, it, it's powerful. It accomplishes what he's going to do. Jesus says it's all going to be fulfilled. It's all about him. And here are some of the ways that this word is useful. It's useful for teaching or doctrine. Uh, it's uh, because truth matters. We are living in a day when people are questioning truth and uh, what all of it means. We can People imagine that they can invent their own truth as though somehow the whole universe is going to bow down uh, to their own personal whims, desires, and interpretations or assumptions. But no, it's the other way around. The whole universe designed by God, undergirded by his reality, his truth, and his purpose and plan is the thing before which we must bow. And it's useful for teaching and therefore truth matters. And I hope you value it when a pastor teaches you doctrine, where you get some basic theology and some of the deeper truths of the word. I hope you value that. It's, it's, it's useful for this. It's good for this. It's, truth is the thing, one of the things that will guard us from going astray. It's good also for uh, reproof. This is the, uh, the, the loving scolding as, as it were. The, the, um, when the word comes and calls us short with regard to what we are thinking, what we are doing, the uh, direction we have taken in our lives, it reproves us, it calls us short, it uh, awakens our, our conscience, and, it, and it's useful for this. The book of Hebrews compares the word of God to being like a sharp two-edged sword that cuts uh, down to the deepest parts of our, our human being. And, uh, and, and this cutting is considered to be a good thing. And, and uh, so here's something that's worth remembering as a pastor, that not all words that we expound, not all sermons that we deliver ought to be those which are merely about comforting and making feel, people feel good. 
irrespective of what's going on in their lives. But that by times there needs to be a uh, rebuking of, of sin, a sharp calling short of a misdirected life, a uh, correcting of erroneous thoughts. This reproof is good. And, it, you know, it's never e an easy thing when we are consciences are pricked by the scriptures, by a sermon or by a study of the scriptures. But um, it, it's good for us, isn't it? It, it is that, is that prick, is that sharp sense of, of lovingly directed pain that uh, causes us to stop whatever it is that we're doing at that point that is leading us into error and sin. It is good not only though for reproof, but also for correction. Now, having been reproved, it is good to redirect us, to correct us towards that which is real and true. And I, I can't help but think of uh, navigation techniques, whether in the olden days on, uh, in, in a, a boat at, at sea or uh, up in the air in an airplane from time to time, uh, sightings are taken of, of a fixed point that they know uh, where it is. It could be the North Star. It could be a uh, landmark on, on a seacoast or whatever. A sighting is taken of some fixed point and then the navigator will s correct the course so that they get safely to their destination. And this is what the Bible does. It helps to correct us. And perhaps one way it's correcting us today is that some of you have been neglecting the scriptures. You have let go regular reading of the word of God, or you have undervalued the preaching of the word of God. And it's time to put into place a corrective here so that you put into place again uh, a listening and a hearing of the word of God, perhaps a, a Bible reading um, uh, practice habit daily, or maybe going to the midweek Bible study or coming with more prayerful anticipation of the Sunday sermons. Uh, praying for the pastor as they prepare the message. All these things help, and, and these will serve as correctives uh, as the Word of God is imparted to us in our lives. It's useful also for um, training in righteousness. This is, uh, we get the word pedagogy here. The, for those of, who are school teachers, they study pedagogy. It's the discipline of, of educating uh, people in uh, as children to adulthood or as an adult into a particular um, life skill or, or discipline, pedagogy. And it's, so it's useful for pedagogy and righteousness. And oh, if we had time, we could talk about righteousness in the Bible. It's, it's such a broad point. It's not merely about the moral purity. It's about justice and uh, doing the right. And uh, it's, it's useful for teaching us in, in all such things. And so here we have this living word of God that uh, Paul is imparting, is uh, stressing in, in Timothy's life and ministry. Timothy's been reminded of the importance of this word of God that he received in his training as a child growing up under the uh, teaching of his mother and grandmother. And it is this word, the whole word, that he is to impart to uh, the church. And part of his ministry is to raise up people who would themselves be equipped to teach the word in the ongoing generations until the Lord returns. And so that is really the uh, basic foundation, ministry of the word of God that I wanted to leave with you today for the pastor. And that is because of the significant central importance of this living word, this written word that comes with power to transform and will be accomplished. It must not be neglected. Otherwise, it's like putting ourselves off to sea without any kind of visual references anymore, except our own impressions or feelings. No, it is this word of God that imparts life. It is this word of God that keeps us safe. It is this word of God that directs us into uh, God's truth. And it is this word of God that Jesus himself, our wonderful savior, is going to fulfill in our lives, in our church, and in our world, and indeed the whole creation. So it, it, it ought not to be minimized. So in the coming weeks, that's what we're going to do. We're going to be looking at some of the practical ways that a pastor is called on to impart this word. It'll take a, just a, probably two messages or so. 
But you can be looking again at uh, First and Second Timothy, as Paul will give some practical instructions to Timothy on how to go about, uh, about this ministry of the word. And as we pray together for the one who would come and serve as pastor here in Moosehorn, uh, may it be that the Lord direct us to a man who loves the word of God and in a disciplined, purposeful, intentional, uh, Holy Spirit-enabled way will be a man of the ministry of the word. And we'll consider that together in the time ahead. Anyway, Lord bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. I look forward to seeing you in March when I'm back from a bit of a vacation. And uh, may the Lord keep you in, in all your ways. And may you know the joy of the Lord as your strength. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for its power in our lives. Thank you that it's unchanging, that from the beginning to the end, Genesis to Revelation, it is the unchanging, reliable, true, inspired word of God. And may we be a church that receives this uh, truth from you, this gift from you, as we look to Jesus, Lord, and as he imparts his power and his life in our, into us, and as he does his will and com uh, completes all of your purposes uh, in through your word. So uh, watch us, keep us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.